Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode 347. Welcome back to the show. Just want to uh, say hello to everybody today. I hope you guys all had a wonderful weekend. If you're listening to this on the day it came out, of course, it's Sunday night, 9.30 p.m. Tell your friends where and when to listen. Of course, uh, we have a little bit of news this week. I I received some news earlier this week that uh, Prince Hall was recognized in Florida. But as the news seems to develop, that's not exactly the case just yet. If you want to read a little bit more about that and see just what's going on with it, head on over to Freemasons for dummies.blogspot.com. Brother Chris Hodep has the whole skinny there for us to check out, but it seems as though there's some initial things happening. They're working on recognition, and it'll probably happen, but not quite yet. So uh, my apologies. I shared that article also earlier this week, hoping it happens soon, and it looks like it will, but not quite yet. We've got a couple papers for you this week. Before we get started, just want to quickly mention a couple things. Of course, uh, the book that I co-wrote with Brother John Ruark, It's Business Time, Adapting a Corporate Path for Freemasonry. If you'd like a little sample of what that's like, head on over to the Midnight Freemasons and check out the first chapter, which is there, and it's called Who Moved My Cheese? That is also the uh, sample you can download right from the Kindle e-store, so if you'd like to have it in print, you can do that. If you want it on Kindle, you can do that, and you can even have it in iBooks. The great, concise guide on several key business strategies and ideas that have been adapted to meet the needs of Freemasonry. It's got great reviews. It's been number one on several lists across Amazon over the past few weeks, so check that out. So the first paper I have for you this week is from the NSW Freemason, or the New South Wales, I believe, Freemason, December 1992, comes from Australia. It's the art of two-ball cane, masonry and metallurgy. We, as Masons, know Tubal Cain is depicted as a blacksmith. We do not know when he lived, but probably in the days when primitive man used tools of stone or flint to work naturally occurring pieces of gold, silver, copper, and meteoric iron into weapons, tools, and ornaments for use in war or peace. At some stage, man utilized fire to liberate metals from their ores. And there came that magic moment some thousands of years ago in Mesopotamia when copper ores bearing tin were melted. This first alloying of metals launched the Bronze Age, a great step forward in this ascent of man. This early metallurgy promoted the first explosion into international trade as bronze coinage formed a novel means of exchange, and the cradle of civilization in the eastern Mediterranean area thus spread to Europe. There is a definite metallic streak running through our masonry. We are divested of money and metallic substances even before we enter the lodge. In the sectional lectures, there is a strong allusion to the extractive metallurgy with the mention of chalk, charcoal, and clay as the emblems of freedom, fervency, and zeal. Clay is our Mother Earth, providing both the metals and the refractories to contain them at high temperatures. From charcoal, we derive the heat energy to smelt and refine them, and from chalk, the flux to alloy with the gang and separate it from the ore. What of metals today? My career as a metallurgist has embraced the casting, working, and fabrication of metals. And today's readers may be interested in the short description of the five principal methods of shaping metals. Casting which involves making a mold, a cavity of the shape required in a plastic material, usually sand, and filling it with liquid molten metal. It constitutes the foundry industry. Working includes forging, rolling, extrusion, rod and wire drawing, and pressing in many ways, both casting and forging, to shape things, date from the days of Tubal Cain. Machining is only about 200 years old. Generally, it includes turning, boring, milling, shaping, and grinding, and is a finishing process for work pieces first cast or wrought to a rough shape. Fabricating by assembly and joining, such as bolting and riveting. The Sydney Harbor Bridge is a good example. Welding and brazing and soldering. Powder metallurgy is a spectacular development of the last 50 years and involves the compacting of metal powders in a dye, followed by sintering at high temperatures to crystallize them into a union. Many parts can be produced by mass production methods, ready for use without machining. 
If Tubal Cain were the first artificer in metals, his disciples today are known as tool engineers who provide the expertise to design and devise the machines, methods, and tools to be used. It is not surprising that nearly all of the working tools presented to us in our craft degrees are essential tools in the fabrication of metals. One cannot imagine a tool engineer without the benefit of the pencil and the rule and the square and the compasses. Metals run like shining threads through the whole tapestry of human history. Besides the invention of coinage, they have played a critical role in the invention of printing, the harnessing of steam, and the internal combustion engine, the discovery and use of electricity, the achievement of powered flight, and the advent of nuclear energy. The art of Tubal Cain, now called metallurgy, is unfolding the secrets of nature and science. The grand architect of the universe provided the materials in the firmament, and man's inspired fashioning of them by tools is, I hope, stamping our work divine. All right, that's that piece. I hope you guys enjoyed a little bit of the history on the ancient art of metallurgy. You know, recently I visited the Ark down in Kentucky, the giant Ark that you guys have probably seen on the news and all over Facebook at times. And one of the things they have in there are some depictions of these early characters, including Tubal Cain. And he, there's an image of him with tattoos all over his face and stuff, like a tribal man. And he's making bronze tools and, and casting steel. Uh, kind of an interesting depiction. I'm not sure how historically accurate that particular uh, picture is, but uh, it was cool anyway. So before we move on, i uh, just quickly mention the presentation schedule. Coming up June 7th, I'll be at Honesdale in Pennsylvania, Honesdale Lodge, and I'll be doing The Lost Word, which is, of course, the Quantum Series Part 2. We talk about the Tetragrammaton. What is fun about it is it explores the Lost Word. It explores string theory, mythology, and it kind of blends the first presentation, Esoterics 101, and the third presentation, which is all about quantum entanglement and the idea of apotheosis. If any of you would like to have me come out to a lodge, uh, just head on over to wcypodcast.com, click on presentation schedule, and uh, you can see the different prepared presentations that I give. I'm really flexible, and we've already started booking some things happening out in 2019 already. I've got something lined up in Atlanta, Georgia. But the remainder of this year is June 7th, Honesdale, PA, August 9th through the 12th, I think, maybe the 10th through the 12th. I'll be in Toledo, Ohio at Camp Masonry. I'll be doing Esoterics 101, and then for a smaller audience, probably The Word. It should be a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to those. I field a few questions each week about where to listen to the show, and I used to tell you all all the time on the different places that we can be heard because some people just like different areas. I don't want you to have to sign up for anything new. So if you're on Apple, of course, you're probably listening to this on the podcast app or you've downloaded it via iTunes. But we are on Stitcher. We are on Roku devices under a few different podcast aggregates. We're on the Digital Podcast Network. But of course, we do have our homemade app. Now, we used to have an app where you would pay for it. It was $2 for the app, and uh, you had access to wallpapers that we made for the episodes, and we also had the papers that we read on the show embedded in the app so that you could download them right there, have them in the palm of your hand so that you could read anything that we read, maybe as a pinch in a lodge, or maybe you just wanted to read it for your lodge for general education or whatever it was. And we actually had such success with that, we were able to go ahead and move it to a new platform called the Podcast Source. Basically, it's now free for anybody so you no longer have to buy the app you can just get it for free so you download the podcast source whether you're on an iphone or an ipad or you can download it for android as well and you open the app you search for whence came you while you're in it and then you add it to your shows and you'll see where you can download all the extras there just for you which includes wallpapers sometimes video clips but most of the time all the papers that we read on the show are in a single pdf document i've also had a few people ask about masonic curators what's going on with masonic curators it's so cool i haven't seen a video in a while and that's true we did 50 episodes of those 50 episodes there were approximately 10 to 15 of them that were submissions by guys like steve harrison by guys like Jared Stanley of What's a Mason, and some others, including Greg Knott. And I don't have much else to offer in the way of things to showcase. The idea is, of course, to have other people produce the video. Send me a cell phone video of you explaining some things, and uh, we'll put the bumpers on there. We'll get it up on the YouTube channel, and we'll put it on the website. So if you head on over to MasonicCurators.com, you can check out the submission guidelines. If you'd like to see more episodes, then tell your friends to make some episodes and uh, send them on over, because 
what we're really trying to do is uh, come up with a really cool archive of great Masonic artifacts, but more than the artifacts, the stories behind those artifacts. So tell us about your thing. Uh, do you have something that you want to tell us about? Showcase it. Uh, so we just have to be MPEG-4 or an MPEG format. So basically shoot it with your cell phone. The audio has to be loud enough to hear it plainly at about a quarter volume. So I can bump the audio for you. Shot in a resolution not less than 420. Again, if you're shooting with a modern day cell phone, this isn't a problem. Try to keep it not more than five minutes, but if you go over, that's fine too. It has to be about a Masonic object. Tell us how you got it what it is, what it means to you. Tell us your name in the video, the lodge, and uh, open the show for us. Welcome to Masonic Curators. I'm Joe Smith. I'm Brother Joe Smith. And then close out the show. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Something like that. All the videos get reviewed. Not all will be accepted. So go ahead and shoot them over those. Submissions should be uploaded to the uh, Google Drive, and then you can send a link to me. So if you have Google, then upload it there and send me a link. Or if you have Dropbox, we can do that too. But uh, if you have questions, shoot me an email, wcypodcast at gmail.com, and we'll get it all set up for you. So that's the status of Masonic Curators. Now the next piece I have for you this week is another rather interesting one. Everybody knows, or at least I hope you all know, I've got a fancy for the mysteries, as in the Greek mysteries. Whether that's Eleusis or Dionysian, I love the old stuff. This one is called The Mystery Degrees. It's by Leslie M. Scott, 33rd degree, Sovereign Grand Inspector General in Oregon. And this was an address before the... Multnomah Council of Kadosh at Portland, Oregon, and appeared in the New Age magazine in August of 1946. Old as philosophy is the phrase, to know is to live. We find that thought in the ancient mysteries, running back thousands of years. To know, said the sages of antiquity, is to believe in the unity of God, to purify the soul, to prepare for the future life, and to do our duty to our fellow man. So said Zarathustra, Socrates, and the man of Nazareth, the authors of the Jewish and Christian scriptures, the authors of Masonic doctrine, the thinkers and reformers of every age, and Albert Pike, the formulator of the Scottish Rite. To know is to live. Men seek to know, so that they may live wiser, better, and happier. Seek, and ye shall find. Luke 11, 9. The phrase live and learn is a cynical reversal of words, better for spiritual and material progress than first to learn, so that one may thereafter live and quote-unquote keep himself unspotted from the world. James 1, 27. The ancients practiced a moral science which the Greeks 2,500 years ago called mysteries. The word generically meant to close the eyes and mouth, to hide. The hidden things inspired the Apostle Paul, who was versed in the mysteries, to say, quote, For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. The science seems to have originated in India and to have spread to Ethiopia, Egypt, Phoenicia, Greece, Persia, Assyria, Rome, Britain, and Scandinavia. It consisted originally of secret religious rites. The Egyptians made much of them and attached legends to their supreme gods Osiris, the father, Horus, the son, and Isis, the spirit. These legends were imitated in the religious and philosophical lore of the peoples of antiquity, including the Goths, and Scandinavians of Northern Europe, and the Druids of Britain. The early Christians used them in their sacramental rites, especially as to the Eucharistic elements of Christ, the communion, and the exclusion of strangers and persecutors. Says Albert Pike, Originally, the mysteries were meant to be the beginning of a new life of reason and virtue. The initiated or esoteric companions were taught the doctrine of the one supreme God, the theory of death and eternity, the hidden mysteries of nature, the prospect of the ultimate restoration of the soul to that state of perfection from which it had fallen, its immortality, and the states of reward and punishment after death. The uninitiated were deemed profane, unworthy of public employment or private confidence, sometimes prescribed as atheists and certain of everlasting punishment beyond the grave. The veil of secrecy was impenetrable, sealed by oaths and penalties the most tremendous and appalling. It was by initiation only that a knowledge of the hieroglyphics, Egyptian, could be obtained, with which the walls, columns, and ceilings of the temples were decorated. The ceremonies were performed at dead of night, with every application that could alarm and excite the candidate. The early Christians taught by the founder of their religion, but in greater perfection those primitive truths that from the Egyptians had passed to the Jews and had been preserved among the latter by the Essenes received also the institution of the mysteries, adopted as their object, the building, or 
of the symbolic temple, preserving the old scriptures of the Jews as their sacred book, and as the fundamental law, which furnished the new veil of initiation with the Hebraic words and formulas that, corrupted and disfigured by time and ignorance, appear in many of our degrees. The formula which the primitive Christian church pronounced at the moment of celebrating its mysteries was the depart ye profane, let a catechumens or the neophytes, and those who have not been admitted or initiated go forth. The unity of design of the mysteries of all lands shows their common origin. They contain secret knowledge and rites of secret worship. At first religious, they became political and promotive of caste and degenerated into charlantry. They were imitated in public pageants. The Rose Festival of Portland uses some of these imitations as its obligation of Rosaria, likewise the Mardi Gras of New Orleans. Such pageants were common in the Lucinian and Orphic Greece, but the real mysteries were exclusive and secretive to their devotees and initiates. The obligations and penalties were solemn and harrowing. The rites contained not only moral precepts and doctrines of deity, the soul, and future life, but also knowing knowledge of astronomy, the harmonious and regular procession of the stars and the seasons, and the precision of numbers and mathematics. They taught lessons of life, death, and afterlife. They were funereal, heroic, dramatic, as in our mysteries of Hiram. To the Egyptians, Hiram was Osiris. To the Persians, Mithras. To the Greeks, Dionysius. To the Christians, the man of Nazareth. Hiram is Kuram, Hebrew meaning noble-born, higher type of humanity, exemplar of what man may and should become in the courses of ages, gifted with glorious intellect, a noble soul, a fine organization, and a perfectly balanced moral being, the possibility of the race made real. Cicero said the mysteries for a wild and ferocious life, they have substituted humanity and urbanity of manners. It is with good reason they use the term initiation, for it is through them that we, in reality, have learned the first principles of life, and they do not only teach us to live in a manner more consoling and agreeable, but they soften the pains of death by the hope of a better life hereafter. Plato, 400 BC, said that the object was to reestablish the soul in its primitive purity. The Roman philosopher 500 years later, Epictetus, to uphold the instruction of man and the correction of morals. Aristotle said the mysteries were the most valuable of all religious institutions, Socrates, that they brought to the dying the most glorious hopes of eternity. The mysteries were practiced in Rome until 400 AD, in Athens until 700 AD, in Wales and Scotland until 1100 AD. They contained conceptions that have deeply affected the religious history of the world. In Greece, they were given in the four stages, preliminary purification, communication of mystic knowledge, revelation of holy things, crowning of the mystic as a privileged person. The Homeric poems, 800 BCE, speak of the comfort brought to the afflicted. Modern Catholics are said to receive similar consolation from the elevation of the host at Mass, which is imitative of the mysteries. The early Christians adopted the Mass of Mithras of the Persian mysteries, and thence took their sacrament and their rites of confirmation. The priests of Mithras used confession and baptism and promised future life of happiness or misery. They celebrated the oblation of bread, image of resurrection, and gave extreme unction. Pythagoras, 500 BCE, had three mystery degrees for which a preparation of five years of abstinence and silence was required. He was familiar with the mysteries of Egypt. He taught mathematics as an evidence of God and his laws, grammar, rhetoric, and logic to improve reasoning powers, and geometry, music, and astronomy for useful knowledge. He taught also the omnipotence of God the immortality of the soul, truthfulness, silence, temperance, fortitude, prudence, justice, and abstinence from vice. Particularly, we owe the fellowcraft instruction to Pythagoras. Plato elaborated the Pythagoras doctrines 100 years later. The Masonic fraternity in this modern repository of the mysteries as used by us, they are shorn of mysticism and superstition and are retentive of spiritual and moral values and doctrines of divinity, unity, and harmony, and future life of the soul. Mankind has made little or no progress in spiritual and moral excellence in thousands of years, nor in expression. The golden rule seems as distant and ideal as when pronounced by the founders of Christianity and Confucianism in 500 BCE. Masonry does not specify the type of a future life, nor the dogma or doctrine that is to be followed. Blue Lodge Masonry pledges belief in a future life, but not in immortal life. Scottish masonry holds the soul to be immortal, but does not postulate the soul's mode of existence hereafter. 
Some of our degrees are likened to degrees of the ancient mysteries, that is to say our degrees in their ritual use the ancient teachings and symbolisms and ceremonials. Other degrees of our series follow the philosophy of the ancient mysteries. We use Hebrew symbolism and discipline. The Druze combination of Hebrew, Muhammad, and the Christian symbolism for masonry is a faith universal sharing the beliefs that are common to all great religions of God, future life, earthly duty, and personal rectitude. The early Christians practiced three degrees based upon the ancient mysteries. Some of ours have a similar sequence and present the essence of the Scottish Rite philosophy. Ancient astronomers saw symbols in the stars. The circle, triangle, square, parallelogram. The spring constellation of Taurus, the bull, ushering in the blazing star of Sirius. The three kinds of Orion, the five Hyades of the seven Pleiades, signifying the mystic numbers 1, 3, 5, and 7. The Nile began to rise as our Columbia River does in the springtime. Osiris returned with Taurus at the vernal equinox to regenerate the world after being slain by Python six months before in the constellation of Scorpio, which is opposite Taurus in the sky. Masonic lodges have many astronomical symbols from the ancient mysteries. Churches have them also. The cross is astronomical, pointing four directions to the universe. The Bible makes many references to the stars. The mysteries have permeated to great religions and still live in them. The birth of the Christ was heralded by a star in the east. We are knights of the brazen serpent because the serpent was an emblem of reason, faith, and repentance. The pharaohs wore their serpent emblem on the brow as a symbol of their piety in the mystery religion. Have we moderns found a better way of explaining the soul's origin and its advent to and departure from the body than the ancients had? Are the plain virtues better known now than then? One of our degrees may be likened to the master's degree and to the third degree of the early Christians to their degree of the faithful, in which the sacramental secrets were confined. Our degree uses Christian symbolisms and Christian forms of discipline and leads to an explanation of the word in the final Masonic Trinity. God, the source of all, his thought conceiving the universe, his word uttering the thought and becoming the creator, the manifestation, the revelation of the word is the universe, material, mental, and spiritual. The triple dogma has long been known to the sanctuaries of the ages, and masonry has other expressions of trinity, such as wisdom, strength, force, beauty, or harmony, faith, hope, charity, liberty, equality, fraternity, also many references to other triads. The search for the word has engaged the great minds of the ages. It is a search for the logos, the nature and purpose of the divine plan for spiritual life and light by which to guide the pathway of truth. Philosophers have variously struggled to define the word. To a mason, the word is a synonym for the true nature of God, intellect of the soul of the universe. It is the unuttered expression of being and life that are in absolute. The search is an allegory or attempts to find the word. In the allegory are represented the general ignorance of the nature and attributes of the true deity, the worship of other deities, and the faulty ideas of the great architect. We say the word once was lost. That is part of the allegory. The writer of St. John's Gospel says, quote, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. End quote. Men have contrived one substitute definition for another, and in this atomic age they are finding new substitutes for their concepts. We say masonry is a science of seeking and finding. We have been told that the substitute word of the master's third degree in Sanskrit meaning, the holy child, the son of God. The formulators of masonry were Christians to whom the true word was a synonym of Christ, the Savior. We could go on and on with substitutes for the word on which men have not been able to join and from which they have passed one after another unsatisfied. Such is the climax of the mystery degrees of the Scottish Rite, paralleling the craft degrees and the Christian degrees and signifying three steps or stages. One, material, blindness, repentance, light. Two, intellectual, sympathy, justice, gratitude, veneration, geometry, rule of harmony. And three, spiritual, rebirth, death, resurrection, faith, new law, love, yea, one another. Masonry holds that justice and beneficence are divine attributes shared by imperfect man. Evil, pain, and sorrow are paths of the divine harmony to be balanced according to the divine plan and not by human creed or doctrine. Says Albert Pike, Masonry inculcates its old doctrine that God is one, that his thought uttered in his word created the universe and preserves it by those eternal laws which are the expression of that thought that the soul of man breathed into him by God is immortal and his thoughts are that he is free to do evil 
or to choose good, responsible for his acts and punishable for his sins, that all evil and wrong and suffering are but temporary, the discords of one great harmony, and that in his good time they will lead by infinite modulations to the great harmonic final chord and cadence of truth love, peace, and happiness that will ring forever and ever under the arches of heaven, among all the stars and worlds, and in all souls of men and angels. This is the Masonic Creed expressed in these four degrees. Believe in God's infinite benevolence, wisdom, and justice. Hope for the final triumph of good over evil and for perfect harmony as the final result of all the concords and discords of the universe. And be charitable as God is toward the unfaith, the errors, the follies, and the faults of men. For all make one great brotherhood. And by the revealing light of initiation, learn, know, and live. All right, I hope you enjoyed that piece. A lot to take in there. However, I feel like it was very well written, and I really liked the explanation of the mysteries and how they paralleled even some early Christian dogma, if I can call it that. It's important to understand there are a lot of concepts within this paper that are historically accurate, which I think doesn't invalidate any particular religion, but we should understand that these same tenets are passed from one to the next over hundreds of years. The portion of the paper that spoke about the word, of course, special place in my heart. If you've ever heard the presentation I do on the word, you'll know that I make many claims about the word, the substitute versions of this word, and how it might be real. If you've got commentary on this, please go ahead and uh, shoot it over to our Facebook page, maybe a comment underneath the episode, and uh, check it out. Before we leave you this week, please let me just ask you to check out wcypodcast.com, which is our website. Go there and hover over support the show and consider making a direct donation to the program to help offset the cost of bringing all this to you. We have an episode every week, except two weeks a year. We only go dark, as we say, for Christmas and New Year's. Any donation is wonderful, whether it's 50 cents or a dollar, whatever. That's great. If you are feeling extremely generous, please consider going ahead and becoming a monthly contributor. Whether you're a contributor at $2 a month, we have a fellow at 5 or if you want to be a producer at $10 a month, that is also available for you. We've worked out some great partnerships with some Masons and some of their products or programs where We've scored a discount for you and only offering things that I think a Mason would be interested in. Things like the Great Books program by Scott Hambrick. If you missed our interview with him, please go back a couple episodes and check that out and consider joining in on the next round of the Great Books program where you can uh, get a really great set of books. You read together, you have Socratic debates with each other on an online forum, live like video cast. It's a really great program. So hover over support the show, click on the Great Books program to learn more. Bankers Best. So if you head on over to buybankersbest.com or go to our website, again, wcypodcast.com, hover over support the show, click on Bankers Best and see the great details of some of the wonderful products Brother Levi Banker has put out. Now, Levi Banker is a wonderful guy, a brother out of St. Louis, Missouri. We've met a few times now and he is just a fantastic individual, is obsessed with quality products. There are imitators out there, but there's only one Bankers Best. This is made by a brother, product is fantastic. There's even Masonic themed products that he sells and he's got new stuff coming out all the time. He's a real thinker and entrepreneur in terms of what he wants to bring to the market, but he only brings it to the market if it's quality stuff. I guarantee that. So check out that link as well. We have our coupon code with Levi. So if you shop at buybankersbest.com, use the promo code BBWCY357 and you'll get 20% off. So it's a great deal for you and you get a little bit of a kickback, comes back to the show, which is awesome for keeping the lights on. We have our coupon code back on on it. So if you go there and you want to pick up some Alpha Brain, my favorite uh, supplement in the whole world, you can read all about it on the website here. I won't take up your time doing that, but 10% off if you use the promo code WCY at checkout. Not a lot, but it'll take care of the postage usually, which it's FedEx, so you get it rather quick. And that's it, guys. I just want to thank every single one of you for all of your support, for your messages. I apologize if I take forever sometimes getting back to your emails or your direct messages on Facebook, whether that's to my author page, to me directly, or to the podcast page. I I try to get to all of those all the time. Uh, So I respond personally to every single inquiry. So sometimes it takes me a minute, and I do apologize if I take 
a couple weeks to get back in some cases. Uh, I really try not to, but thanks anyway for waiting and not losing faith in me, and thanks for letting me bring you this show week after week. You guys are the best, and you guys are the ones who make this show so successful, and those guys out there, you know who you are, who help produce this program, make it available for everybody else. You are specifically responsible for countless men joining this fraternity just by assisting with the production of this show. So thank you so much. It's one small way that we can really build Freemasonry this century. That's it, guys. Until next week, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.